And Atiba, I want you to go wherever I go. And I want you to just read the phone book. I have a dream. Is that dream still alive? The words that we just heard, powerful, many, many years ago. Are they still alive today? We only find out by asking the uncomfortable questions, by being willing to sit in the fire and to ask what needs to be asked, to confront what needs to be confronted, and to own that which needs to be owned. Questions are a beautiful way to get to the core of the matter, to get to the place of oneness that we seek, and sometimes that's a very uncomfortable journey. How many parents do we have in the room today? Oh, a lot of parents. You all know, I'm sure, firsthand, there's one little word that can perpetuate an endless dialogue of suffering over and over and over again that your children will ask you, who knows what that word might be? Why? 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 I had a beautiful slide for that. I hope it can go up there. Is it up there? No, that's not it. There it is. Kids take the crayons and put why all over the wall. Why, why, why? This question, as annoying as hell as it can be, leads to a greater clarity. And as a parent, let me tell you firsthand, you can get really frustrated with that why, why, why question. Well, because I said so. Because I said so. Let me say, as a parent, as a white man, because I said so is not an acceptable answer. Because it's always been that way, and it's because it's my rule, is not an acceptable answer. So yes, let us ask why. Let us be annoying as children of God, asking the question why, to get to the deeper truth and the deeper answers that are calling for expression within ourselves individually and within our collective humanity. People like Socrates, Martin Luther King Jr., Jesus, Buddha, Lao Tzu, and even Jewish scriptures as well, use a method of using questions to get to the deeper reality, to the deeper truth. They kept a dialogue going. They kept a debate going. They kept the questions coming as a means of getting to the greater answers to life's most important question. And so the most important question we want to ask today, is the dream still alive? Why is it it doesn't look like that on the surface to my eyes? Why is it I'm not experiencing that? Or why is it that I'm blind to it? Good questions to ask. Maybe there's something to the idea that Jesus said in the Gospels, you must become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Could it be that our questions are the portal through which we're going to find heaven and not status quo? Not words like, because I say it so, or because we've always done it that way. Maybe the questions are necessary for the kingdom of heaven that we are all seeking to emerge and there's nothing comfortable about those questions because we have come, come face to face with the, that which is out of congruity with the oneness that we're seeking. We have to confront the human conditions that are out of congruity with the heaven on earth that we are all seeking and that we all know. Socrates said this. Let's put the quote up there so we can all read it together. Together, true wisdom comes to each of us when we realize how little we understand about life, ourselves, and the world around us. To know is to know that you know nothing. That is the meaning of true knowledge. We often say here at Unity North that it's the people in your life that are saying, I have all the answers, here's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Run as fast as you can away from them. Because they're probably perpetuating an old antiquated idea that needs to be investigated and they're not willing to look at the questions that are going to open up a field where a greater possibility can emerge. Asking why we believe something, asking why something is true or why it exists can be an effective method of challenging old paradigms and contextualizing our spiritual path. Today is the first of a four-part series on Socratic spirituality. And yes, Socrates was actually a very spiritual man as well as a deep thinker and philosopher. And I believe that it is fortuitous that it begins on Martin Luther King. I would love to say I planned that, but I didn't on this weekend. But it seems absolutely perfect because Dr. King used the method to get things done. 
Let me give you four um, characteristics of the Socratic method. And see, as you uh, hear these, how they might apply to your spiritual path or not. Let's go ahead and put them up there. The Socratic method is a skeptical method. It is conversational, it is conceptual, and it is empirical. What does that mean? Well, let's begin to play with that. Skeptical. This is not argument for the sake of tearing down. This is healthy debate. It is not attack to tear down something, but it is a skeptical mindset that says there might be a greater truth. Let me ask the questions that get to the deeper reality, the higher vibration, and the greater, the greater truth that wants to emerge here. So healthy skepticism must be part of an evolving, growing religion. If it is not, we are perpetuating an old paradigm that might want to be looked at. But we put the blinders on and say, no, no, this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let me remain in my stagnation. So the Socratic method says, let me ask why I believe, why I believe what I believe. Why I study what I study. Why I have accepted these ideas from my teachers, my ministers, my parents, and my grandparents as true. There's nothing wrong with a healthy skepticism if it is founded in love and respect. Number two, it must be conversational. I, don't, I, I find it interesting, and we're doing it here today, that the religious systems of the United States of America is a heck of a lot of monologues. I get to come up here, and I get to talk for 20, 30, 4, 5 hours. <laughs> and that's contextualizing your spiritual path. And all across the country, there are ministers standing up like me saying, here's the truth, accept it, believe it. Here, I love to say, if you've got something to say, put your hand in the air and say it here at Unity North. Because the wealth of information, the wealth of understanding of our God being is far increased when it's not coming through one person's mindset. And that I actually challenge you to do that, to challenge me, because I become more of a spiritual being with your challenge. A greater truth will come when we talk to each other and don't just listen to one voice in the room. Now, this conversation, is, it, it, this dialogue is much more important than the monologue, but it must be for the goal of agreement. Where can we build a bridge between us? How can we find a place of agreement? It's not to tear down. The wrong mindset. Socratic method is not about tearing down. It's about digging deeper. Number three, it must be conceptual. We've got to deal with concepts that aren't so easy to get our intellect around. Ideas. Unity says that everything in this life is based upon a divine idea. That means we have to look, look beneath the surface of what our mind has believed to more esoteric ideas, more ethereal ideas, words like justice. Sounds like Martin Luther King Jr. to me. Piety. Wisdom. Courage. Beauty and goodness, all divine ideas found within the civil rights movement of this country that we need to revisit and bring out into the field so that we can dance in this ethereal spiritual nature. So it is conceptual. And number four, my favorite of the method, is it must be empirical. Don't tell me what you believe and that you believe for centuries. Show me. Show me the money. Don't just tell me, regurgitate, all right. Don't just tell me what somebody told you and passed down generation to generation to generation. Jesus said, you'll be known by your fruits. Show me. Give me the evidence of that truth that you are believing spiritually in your life. Let yourself and your spiritual path be known by the fruits, by the actions that you were taking. Talk is basically cheap. And Dr. Martin Luther King basically said, talk is cheap. And he did it in the Oval Office with President Lyndon B. Johnson. Talk is cheap. Put your pen where your mouth is. That was a, a Socratic method. He was skeptical to what he was hearing from people that looked like me. It was conversational. He did not attack. It was conceptual. Oneness is a concept that we can spend hours and lifetimes talking about and then let your truth be known by the truth that you are demonstrating. Our fifth unity principle. He used that. The Socratic method shines a light on the inconsistencies through dialogue, discussion, and debate. For the next four weeks, we're going to be using that same method. Dr. King used, the things, used these four things to shine a light on the darkness of inequality and the accepted ignorance of the time. If we are to keep the dream alive, we need to be willing to do the same thing. And let me tell you, I've come face to face with somebody uh, who has brought to my attention my own ignorance. 
who asked questions of me and pointed out that perhaps looking like I look, I was perpetuating a system that I was inadvertently not paying attention to. That I was perpetuating a system that was broken and that I needed to put my ears on. You see, when we have dialogue, that means I have to listen as much as I speak. In the conversation, I need to put my ears on as much as my mouth is moving. In fact, sometimes more because I have two ears and one mouth. So just like Martin Luther King and Socrates, our great way shower Jesus. His whole life was about using dialogue and using question. And he questioned the authority as a means of ushering in a new paradigm. We need to follow the example of these fine people. The Jewish tradition has a method called Haggadah questioning. They actually encourage in the Jewish religion questioning the, the canon, questioning the accepted scriptures of the time, not as a means of tearing them down, not to stump or to confound, but to bring a greater clarity. I love when the Buddhist monks come and they, they have a, an actual spiritual practice that they demonstrate for us of healthy debate. And it's very playful. It's very fun. And there's laughing. And there's, but they're de dealing with difficult spiritual concepts and challenging each other to take those concepts to a deeper place. Buddhist scriptures talk about the purpose of discussion, counsel, and listening to each other is basically the liberation of the mind through non-attachment. And so for the next four weeks, we are asking you to be non-attached to the truth that you have known up to this moment, religiously, spiritually, ethnically, politically, to suspend all of it and be willing to sit humbly and vulnerably in a question, in a dialogue place, skeptical that maybe the truth that you have held needs to change, needs to go up a vibration, up a level. And there's nothing comfortable about that. But tension, if you look at Mother Nature, tension is a necessary component for greater realities to emerge. You know, sometimes, I don't know if you've noticed that, religious people are the first ones to run from any kind of debate. And we like to think that we're immune to that. But as New Thought people, how many people have ever been confronted by a very orthodox Christian friend and you run as fast as you can out the other way? Why is that? Why is it we are afraid to have healthy, loving, respectful debate? Could it be fear? Fear that our theory might be disproven? Fear that what we have believed for so long, for centuries, might be disproven? Fear that I might have to look at how I am perpetuating a system. I'm actually participating and adding fuel to a system that is actually counter to the dream that was alive at one point. So I need to sit humbly and put my ears on and begin to listen at a deep place. So I want to ask you some questions using the Socratic method, using your spiritual path as a context. Is fear the dominant energy or is it a thirst for truth? When you are confronted with somebody challenging you on what we teach here at Unity or what you believe as an individual, is the foundation of your spiritual path fear-based or is it a thirst for greater knowledge? For greater truth. The Socratic method says it must be the thirst for God. That the fullness and the richness of the spiritual experience. To touch the hem of the garment of the experience of God. It must be a quest for truth and not fear based. Plain and simple. Let me ask some more questions. Would you rather continue to live in a disproven theory. Or would you rather come closer to God. Only you could answer that. Sometimes we're real happy in our comfort zone. Don't tell me any more information because I'm totally content. But here in unity, we are hungry for a greater and greater realization of God that will only be the, the answer, the only answer to the healing of the human race as we know it today. Plain and simple. And so I'm challenging you, just as Martin Luther King challenged an entire nation, is your spirituality fear-based or is there a greater degree of oneness, of compassion, and kindness that must emerge for all people. We get to ask ourselves that question today. Is the dream still alive? More questions. Could it be that we are unwilling to budge and get into the, 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 the skeptical, conceptual debate because the God of our understanding is not up to the challenge? How big is the God that you believe in?
Next time you run away from the Orthodox Christian, stand in the fire and say, help me understand. Tell me more. Or the, the Muslim that you run into on the street and you don't understand their philosophy, tell me more. Help me understand. Why is it you believe that? Why? 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 I guarantee you that if you can sit in the fire and ask the question of why, whether it be in an Oval Office with the President of the United States or it be in a grocery store talking to a new friend, that if you sit in the question long enough, just like the parents, you get to a greater clarity. You get to the depth that we need to get to in order for oneness to be a reality. Otherwise, we are spinning our wheels. The Socratic method to our religious systems must be applied. Some more questions. Is the spiritual goal truth or being right? Is the goal a greater realization of God or is it an attachment to an opinion? Is my spiritual path based on form or fact? I'm saying we want to live in the world of fact. And I submit to you from the great teacher Jesus that a religious system that is not open to dialogue, discussion, and debate is a house founded upon sand. Your spiritual system that is not subject to debate, to questioning, to skepticism, to dialogue is a house founded upon sand and eventually the waves will come of life and it will fall out. You see, debate is not a bad thing when it is handled with love and respect. I'm not saying let yourself be abused. Stop back from abuse. But there are people of different thought process that exist in this world that will come with love and respect. Dr. Martin Luther King is absolutely one of them. A lady that I'm going to bring up here in a moment did exactly the same thing when I was confronted with my own paradigms and my own need to shift. It came with love. The, not, not accusation, it was not accusation. The question came with love and it came with respect. Let us be the ones that don't back up. Let us be the ones that stand in the fire and let the questions take us both to a greater reality. In order to do that, we have to be okay with paradox. And here's a paradox. I'm going to give you some examples from the world scriptures, but is it possible to be a good person and perpetuate a racist system at the same time? That doesn't make sense to the human mind. But if you're willing to open your ears and listen, it makes all the sense in the world. It's a paradox. To be a good person and be perpetuating a racist system at the same time? Nothing comfortable about that question. Let's go back to the Holy Scriptures in the Upanishads. Here's a paradox. Through sitting still, I travel far. I see that which is unseen. That makes no human sense. When you sit in the question of why, why, you get to the meat. You get to the juice. The Buddha said you only lose what you cling to. What? That makes no sense. You only lose what you cling to? Huh. Let me dismiss it too quickly. Or let me use the Socratic method. Why is that? How can that be? What is mine? How is that living alive in me? You see, the Socratic method is myutic. It is empirical. How is it alive in me? Let, me? let me call forth the energies within me to see how that can be in the same field. Christian scriptures, let me tell you, Jesus was the master of paradox. He was the master of awakening the mind and challenging the old paradigm so that a new paradigm could be ushered in. Here's what was said in the scriptures. I conquer by yielding. That sounds like Martin Luther King. Non-violent resistance. I gain strength through weakness. We are made great by becoming small and free by becoming a servant. We are exalted when we are humble. There's nothing humble about saying, you're accusing me of something that isn't true. Ha, let me dismiss you. No, it takes a great deal of humility. I am a servant to the oneness that I seek, not necessarily my own human ego. And so I must keep the dream alive by being a servant to what is in my field because it's not there by accident. It is in dying that I find life. It is in dying to an old idea, to an old system, that a new system can be born. Dr. Martin Luther King gave his life. I only help hope to be as courageous. I can see the vision. 
And Dr. King said, I can, I've been to the mountain. I can see it, but I probably won't go there with you. He knew what was happening, just as Jesus knew what was happening. Now, I'm not saying today that any one of us has to put our life in the midst of fire in order to perpetuate the dream. But I will say wholeheartedly with all the passion in the world that I would rather go to my grave knowing that I gave my life for a greater idea, a new paradigm that has transformed the planet long after I'm gone, than to play it safe and just say, oh, poppycock. I don't know where the word poppycock came from. <laughs> Lao Tzu in Taoism said the soft overcomes the hard, the weak overcomes the strong. Bhagavad Gita Holy Scriptures of Hinduism. The Supreme Lord walks and does not walk. I don't get that. Good, ask a question. He is far away, but he is very near as well. I don't get that. Let me play with that. Is it possible that God became particularized as one man named Jesus, but God also became particularized to you at the same time? It is possible to sit with an Orthodox Christian and celebrate the truth that they follow a man that they believe to be the veritable presence of God and you to know in within your own field that that presence of God, that same presence of God is absolutely at the point of view. It is possible, but only if you sit in the right questions and don't run from the fire. He is outside of everything, yet he is within everything. This sounds like unity teaching. God is eminent and transcendent all at the same time. We have made God imminent at the point of one man and never questioned it. And that man had a dark face, whether historically we want to face that or not. He had a dark face. Subtle racism exists everywhere. Centuries upon centuries that told the painters, put a white face on that painting. Put a white face on that picture. And let's maybe subtly erase what's going on. And so is the dream still alive? To the extent that we don't let subtleties continue. The subtleties of erasing a problem that exists in our backyards. In our public school system today. If people with great minds like this have a willingness to dig deeper to discuss, to dialogue, to debate out of a thirst for knowledge underneath the paradoxes that we face. I believe it is possible for us to be the changers of the paradigm and to usher in a new one by channeling the inner Lao Tzu, the inner Buddha, the inner Christ, the inner Martin Luther King Jr. that says, I will not shrink back from the difficult conversation. That's what this four-week series is going to be about. And I promise you that if I'm doing my job, it will be a little uncomfortable. But I don't want to live in the comfort zone. Well, I do a little bit. I want to take a foot out and say, let's just see what's out here. Because I guarantee you, there's a lot more God to be found out there than there is here. I'm going to invite uh, Michael Burke, who usually reads his own poetry and his own words. I've invited him to come put an exclamation point on this Socratic method, and to use the words of the hero, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., words that he put into a letter that he wrote sitting in an Alabama jail. He called in the energy of Socrates and this method. This is th that's a beautiful letter. This is just some excerpts from it. But I invite you to open up your heart to see how these words might be living within you inside the prison of our own humanity and our own system that is calling to break out of that jail. Michael. Thank you, Richard. But let's also consider, you know, where this man was when he was writing this. What an amazing letter. I'm going to read one part, and I'll read a second part, and I'm going to read that first part again. Let's hear it. I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive, nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. 
just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal. We must, we must see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. This is what he's feeling when he's in there. He's cursed for his actions. And he's speaking to the people that accused him of these actions and the actions he inspired in others when he says, in your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But is this a logical assertion? Isn't this like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Isn't this like condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical inquiries precipitated the act by the misguided populace in which they made him drink hemlock. I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive, nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal. We must see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. This speaks to us right now, just as it did then. Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And I would say the unexamined religion is also not worth living. The unexamined system that we live in today must be examined. And we need to get okay with the tension that comes. 